My name is Lauri Järvilehto, and for the next uh, uh, 15 minutes or so, I'd love to talk about the future of learning and the future of game learning. In other words, how do computer games and mobile games figure in the way we are going to learn in the future and the way our children are going to learn? So I'm going to talk a bit, a bit about what kind of challenges education and our world altogether faces right now. Then I, I want to introduce to you guys three theses about learning that we've discovered in the last five years since we've been researching and experimenting with game learning. And finally, I want to share some ideas about how games and learning games can actually figure in this uh, equation. So as uh, William Gibson, the famous science fiction writer, once said, uh, the future is already here, it's just not quite evenly distributed. And that's the challenge right now. The world is full of amazing things happening. I mean, we live in an awesome, exciting time, don't you think? And at the same time, as we live in an amazing, inspiring time, like Elon Musk wants to cover the whole world with solar panels and give us an abundance of energy, and virtual realities are giving everybody access to amazing vistas of experience and so forth. And like, you know, it's just as a backup plan, once again, Elon Musk wants to shoot some people into Mars if we happen to screw things up down here. And the challenge is that even though we have all these amazing inspiring things going on in the world, they are being complemented by a kind of a different kind of trend. So what I'm talking about here, what I think Slush embodies perfectly is the trend of hope, the trend of looking into the future, future gazing, thinking about what could come next, what amazing things could we do next. But there is also another trend, the trend of fear, the back-gazing trend, the trend where we are looking like, you know, please, could somebody rewind us back to 1980s? And as we can see in global politics, this trend is also strong. Now, I don't know which of these trends is going to win at the end. I think they're pretty much even right now. But I certainly know where the hope of humanity lies, and I know which trend I want to be building myself. And I believe, I hope, that I share this dream with you guys. That by looking into the future, by believing that we can do amazing things, we can make the world a better place. Now, this turmoil and progress stem from the same source, uh, the uh, progress of technologies. And that's constantly changing the world faster and faster, which is leading to a situation where we have a growing gap in how people actually manage this change. In other words, we have a growing attention gap, a gap in the way we learn. On one hand, we have, like kids are being bombarded. We're amazing at entertaining. Kids, like my kids, they're like walking Pokemon encyclopedia. They know everything about Pikachu and Bulbasaur and Squirrel and so forth. And on the other hand, when they go to school, being, like, be, having been bombarded with all these amazing experiences, they feel let down when they have to study in a different way. And this gap is widening constantly. And we need to close the gap. And this is why we need new ways to learn. We've been looking into game learning since 2011, uh, since Peter Westerbakka, Trovi, and some other people, Sanna Lukander, who's an amazing learning pioneer, started looking into whether we could leverage games in learning. Uh, through these last five years, I've come across three theses that I feel are super compelling about how we should regard learning. Now, the first one is a little embarrassing for myself. You see, in 2012, I wrote a book called Learning as Fun. You can still get it as an e-book on Amazon if you want. And about half a year, year after the book was published, I realized that I had made a terrible mistake. There was a huge, glaring mistake in the book. And worst of all, it was printed right there on the cover. Namely, the idea that learning is something that needs to be funnified or gamified or converted into something is totally wrong. 
There is no learning as fun. Because learning, when it happens, is one of the most fundamentally amazing experiences human beings can, can have. AKA, learning is fun. And that means that in order for us to transform education, transform the way we learn, we have to acknowledge that we don't have to fix learning, we have to fix the way we get to learning. So we have to fix our educational systems and practices so that learning actually happens. Now, the second fundamental thesis, fundamental truth about learning that I discovered uh, in this research was that learning always is hard work. And that seems kind of like, you know, paradoxical in terms of like, you know, if it's fun, if it's like song and dance all the time, so that's not hard work, right? Exactly. It's not, the kind of fun I'm talking about when I say the learning is fun, it's not the kind of like, let's all make a circle and dance around, da 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 da. There is actually not a scientific uh, term for that. That's learning that sucks. And that's the kind of thing like, you know, we do right now in, in, in like, you know, all over the world. We think that if we sugarcoat the learning, it's going to be fun and everybody's going to love it. But that's not the thing. We have to get to the point where people actually put themselves into the game, really engage with learning, really throw themselves into it. They start learning, their eyes light up, they're excited, their curiosity is stoked. And then when they start doing the repetitions again and again and again, you know, like the great Austrian authority on learning and education once said, I'm talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger, that learning takes reps, reps, reps. And the amount of reps or repetitions it takes is gigantic. So learning is always hard work. So the question is, how do we get to the position where it's hard work? Now, the interesting thing about creating learning games, as we do with Lightyear, is that actually uh, games that many people, many critics of game learning tend to say games, that games are easy, that they're a mindless waste of time. How many of you guys actually play games regularly? Just raise your hand. Well, you, every single one of you who plays games regularly, you know that the best games are not easy. They're actually the best games are the ones that constantly challenge you more and more and more, push you forward, help you grow better into playing that game. It's kind of like our CTO, Alberto, said yesterday that when we've been designing our first learning game, Big Bang Legends, a particle physics game, that's by the way, soft launching today uh, here in Finland, uh, Alberto said that this is a game that we've designed so that everybody loves the graphics. So people love the characters, they love the backstory. Everybody loves the graphics and everybody hates playing the levels. And that's, I think that's, you know, the recipe for a great game. It's something that keeps on challenging you so much that I, I've, I've spent like countless nights thinking that I, I hate our lead designer because he's making so difficult levels that I just can't let them go. And that's what I mean when I say the learning is hard work. It's when you're curious, when your eyes light, light up, when you feel like, I need to figure this out. I can't let go before I understand that. And that's just amazing. That's amazing fun, isn't it? Now, the last thesis is, I think, one of the most fundamentally important theses for, you know, for our time and life right now. And that thesis is that there are no stupid people. I used to do, I actually, I have a PhD uh, in theoretical philosophy, so I used to do academic research back in the day. And I say, when I say there are no stupid people, this is what a philosopher would say is a ontological truth. Ontology is the field of philosophy that investigates what exists, what there is. So, you know, these are the guys who ask the questions of why is there rather something than nothing at all. And they're the guys who ask the question like, do you really know that you're here or are you actually dreaming or in virtual reality or the matrix? So ontology is, you know, for at least philosophy geek like me, it's like the coolest thing ever. So it's an ontology, ontological fact of how things are in the world that there are no stupid people. There are two kinds of people. There are people who already know, who have learned, and there are people who don't yet know. And the learning is the bridge from not knowing to knowing, from not understanding to ending, from not being able to being a master. And everybody can bridge that gap 
if they start at a pace that is suitable for them, if they keep on pushing themselves, if they put in the hard work, and if they find the love of learning, the fun of learning, the amazing, amazing light in the eyes, sort of throwing yourself and engaging with what you're learning about. So we've been investigating learning games for the last five years. We started Lightyear about a year ago. My co-founders are Lauri Kontari, the guy who started Rovio's animation studio. Peter Westerbakka, the guy who was until recently uh, the mighty eagle of Rovio and who joined our team in September as our brand breaker. Uh, and Niklas Head, who's the uh, founder of Rovio. We have an amazing world-class team of 14 people. I mean, it's like every day I come to work and I'm blown away about these, these people. Every day something happens that my, makes my jaw drop. Maybe it's Lisa making a new character. Maybe it's Alberto creating a new kind of really amazing logical structure in the code. Uh, maybe it's Ilari making one, one more level that I really hate, but I can't let go. Every single day, these guys are superheroes. It's humbling and amazing to be blessed enough to be able to work with these guys, to work on something that I feel is going to be transformative to how we learn. Now, the important thing about learning games is that we used to joke, there were two kind of, kind of like, you know, jokes we used to make. One was like, you know, that one day we're going to teach quantum physics to four-year-olds. This, this was one we used to say a lot with Peter. And I was thinking like, you know, it's a kind of a catchphrase. But I'll go back into that later. And the other one was like, you know, that one day we'll create games that make people into PhDs. And the latter, we later realized, when you're making learning games, <coughs> our co-founder Lauri Kontori realized during this development process that you can't teach everything in a game. Because in order for the game to be actually a big transformative power, it has to be able to compete as a game with the best of the best of the best games out there. It has to be able to stand on its own as a game against Candy Crush Saga and Angry Birds and Clash of Clans and so on and so forth. And in order to do a game that is as compelling as these best games out there, you can't you know, force feed the player anything you want them to learn. You have to be more subtle. You have to do what we call stealth learning or invisible learning. I'll look back to that in a bit as well. So Lauri realized that actually what we need to do is we need to take this space where people already play games and love them, and we're introducing sneaking in con concepts that they can later use in life. In this case, concepts of particle physics. And that's going to be the missing link between what naturally engages people and what we want the people to learn. So that when they come to school later on in life, when kids who have played Big Bang Legends come to school, Instead of being totally intimidated about, for example, the periodic table of elements, they're going to love it because they're going to recognize all these cute little characters like helium and neon and thorium and uranium and so forth. And it's going to be for those kids, like I said, my kids are like Pokemon encyclopedia. So how about we make them into particle physics encyclopedia? How cool is that? Now that's the kind of future we envision. So learning games can function as the spark, the initiator of learning. But when that spark is lit, then there is nothing better, no better way to learn than the very traditional ways of going to an amazing lecture by a great professor, reading a good book. All these things that are kind of like, you know, pushed down right now in this kind of rush to digitalization are actually amazing ways to learn when you want to learn. And games can be the spark that we can light up in the eyes of people so that they start to want to learn about things. So we've had some amazing playtesting results. Like I said, we're soft launching the game today, so we're kind of you know, scared, silly about how you guys are going to think about our game. And having said that, I would love it if you have a Finnish account on your App Store that you download the game at some point today. It's, it's been available for about two hours now. So, We've been playtesting the game. The results have been quite encouraging. So we've been getting like, you know, five-star reviews, a steady stream of five-star reviews in Playtest Cloud. And we've been testing it in schools. The kids have loved it. But one particular playtesting session really struck me as something that I think pretty much demonstrates how we can leverage games in the future of learning. So two weeks ago, I was playtesting uh, the game at a Helsinki-based uh, elementary school fourth graders, about 10 years old. 
And we had 25 kids playing the game for 40 minutes. And they were like, you know, their eyes were lit up, they were screaming, they were like, like, at least five of these kids said like, you know, this is the best game ever. Five out of 25. So after 12, 40 minutes, we wrapped the kids up. We, and I started asking them, like, what did you think? And everybody was like, you know, it's amazing. I love it. It's great. It's so much fun to, like, you know, fight against these antimatter monsters. Now, before we started this session, I asked these kids, how many of you know what an atom is? And two out of 25 raised their hands. So afterwards, when I was polling these kids, there was this one particular 10-year-old girl who had actually, and I kid you not, she had performed a SWOT analysis of the game. So she had a piece of paper and she'd analyzed the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of Big Bang Legends. And her analysis was as follows. She said that the strengths are that this super fun, you know, the creatures are amazing, especially the dog is lovable. There's a cute neon dog in the game. The weakness is that I didn't learn anything in 40 minutes. And I was like, uh-oh, we're like two weeks away from launching this game. It's supposed to be a transformational learning game. And now this 10-year-old is telling me that she didn't learn anything. So what I did next was that I polled the class and asked them, how many of you guys know how many quarks go into a proton? How many of you guys know how many quarks go into a proton? Just raise your hand. Everybody, every single one of the 25 kids raised their hand. I asked them how many protons go into a helium atom. They raised their hands. I asked them, can you name three or four atoms? They raised their hands. 40 minutes of playing a game. And that was the moment when I realized that when we were like jokingly saying with Peter that, yeah, one day we're going to teach quantum physics to kids and it's going to change the way we learn. Well, you know, it's not quantum physics yet. It's just particle physics. But to quote Peter here at the end, I think it's a good start. Thank you very much.